ask you as we get started today, are you a person who, if somebody's got good news and bad news, they want you want the good news first or the bad news first? Bad news. Yeah, isn't that that's so funny? That's the way just about everybody is. Give me the bad news first. And I wonder if that's because we think, you know, give us how bad's it going to get. If you can give it to us, here's how bad it is, and then we can brace ourselves and we can deal with what comes next. You think maybe that's why? I don't know. End of psychology for today. But what do you do with the good news when you get good news? What if you get really good news? Do you go and spread it around and tell everybody about it? Can't wait to tell everybody about it? I'll tell y'all, we found out in March of this year, or early April, that little Ava Pearl was on the way. But we didn't tell nobody for a little while, and that was hard, because I am terrible. I am terrible at keeping secrets. (laughs) But I did good, fairly well. I wasn't perfect, but I was fairly good at it. But don't you, isn't that what you want to do though? When you get really good news, you want to tell people, you want to spread it around, you want to get that news out there, you're fired up about it. If your team won yesterday, I know soon football is kicking off. (laughs) Oh, I didn't mean that. That's funny. It is kicking off. And all the Alabama fans are going to come in Sunday and talk about how good they beat some no name second rate team the day before. No, 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 no. Let's don't throw things at me. But the interesting thing is, what we're going to look at today, the second half of this uh, event of the transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew 17, uh, specifically verses 9 through 13, if you want to make your way there, is what we're going to see is this, this moment that was incredible that a select group of disciples uh, got the privilege of being a part of. Remember, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. He took them up onto a mountain, and there he unveiled his glory for a moment. And these men got to see Jesus not in his uh, God taking on flesh self, but in his deity in a sense. They got to see his royal majesty on display. What a life-changing event. It's a game changer. It's life-altering. And then Jesus is going to tell them something today surprising coming on the heels of that event. And what I hope we actually make our way through today is is really figuring all this out, this second half of this story, and see exactly how maybe it could apply to our lives today. But let's read the text and we'll get started. So Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 9, and you'll remember this is right after they're on the mountain, Jesus is glowing, they're, uh, they're all terrified, then Moses and Elijah show up and they talk to Jesus, incredible, if that wasn't enough, the voice of God the Father is going to speak, and Peter, James, and John fall down, scared to death, and then Jesus comes over, he touches them, and he says, no, don't be scared, it's, it's me, I'm here, we're all right. And the moment is past. On the heels of that, Jesus does something incredible, something unexpected maybe to you. In verse 9 it says, And as they were coming down the mountain, this is right after that event, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Then why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. They didn't recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Now you may read this and think, well, this is great. That's that's not too much in their little discussion as they're coming down the mountain. But let me encourage you with this. There is a reason that Matthew, when he penned this gospel under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he didn't write about this incredible moment on top of the mountain where this insane thing happened. No no one's ever seen anything like it. And then he really could have, you, you may think he could skip right down to verse 14 and start talking about Jesus miraculously delivering a boy from demon possession. That would may seem like an, a next obvious thing. You go from something incredible to something incredible. Yet, for some reason, the Holy Spirit thought that this second half, this actual walk down the mountain was important enough to include in the scriptures. And I want to suggest that there's quite a reason that it's in here. If you notice first, it says, as they were coming down the mountain... I want you to understand first that coming down the mountain is a necessary event. One, in practicality, because once you go up a mountain, the obvious thing is (laughs) 
eventually you come back down, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're good with that. But think of it this way also. Have you ever in your life had what you would call or what you could classify as a mountaintop experience with the Lord? One of those interactions or, or, or times when, when you just felt like you were with Him. Those moments you can look back on and just know that in that moment, man, God was there. He showed up. It was amazing. Maybe it's your salvation experience. That'd be a great mountaintop experience to remember in your own life. Or maybe it's a you know, great revival service or a great Sunday morning even that you had. Or, or maybe it could even, these, these moments don't have to be that grandiose. They could even be that great prayer time you had in your car. Or that song just came on and the message of that song just hit you just right and you and God had a moment. But you know what I'm talking about with these mountaintop experiences? When you just know you were with God in that moment. Just like Peter, James, and John. They know they were with God in this moment. And those are the moments we live for. Those are our favorite. We want the mountaintop experience because the other side of the mountain is what? The valley. And who wants to be in a valley? But don't we know that life is full of valleys? Seems to have more valleys than it has mountaintops sometimes, doesn't it? Something about that valley. But let me tell you the thing about it. Those moments of mountaintop experiences are moments that we enjoy, that we look forward to, that we crave, that we want. But they're relatively rare. And the valley experiences I would recommend and suggest are more common because it is when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death that we realize that the Lord is with us. It's when you're in trouble, when things aren't going the way you want them to, when you need Him are the moments that you finally realize that He's actually there. I would also suggest that in the valley is where you gain strength. The Lord allows you to go into a valley of sorts because in that valley you learn to rely on Him and you get stronger. It's those spiritual muscles, that faith muscle, dependency on Him that you exercise in a valley. And you know what happens when you exercise a muscle? It gets stronger. Well, it gets sore. <laughs> Eventually it gets stronger. And that's exactly what I would suggest is happening here. There are moments we need the valleys, but Lord, we crave the mountaintops, but they're a great time of encouragement, but not where we want to get strong. Because, you know, we all, ugh, couldn't we all just say that we'd love to get strong, we'd love to get sanctified, and never struggle? Wouldn't that be good? If you never had to struggle yet, you could accomplish everything, you could be what you wanted to be, you could walk with God how you wanted to walk with Him, but never have a hard day. Wouldn't that be great? Well, that ain't how it works. <laughs> we need those valleys. The amazing moments with God, though, these mountaintop experiences, they're rare and they're special. But I would suggest another thing here, that the reason they were coming down the mountain, not just because it's the logical thing, you've got to come down a mountain, but also because these moments are not the moments you live in. We don't live on top of the mountain. You remember back on when we talked about it last week, when all this incredible stuff happened. Peter said, wow, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are all here on this mountain. Let us all just build three tents and we'll just camp here. We'll just stay here. But Jesus said, no, that's not what we're going to do. They're going to come back down that mountain because we don't live on top of these mountains in this regard. Because our work is not done on the mountaintop experiences. Our work is done in the road. Our work is done on the plain. Our work is done as we're going forward for Jesus. And you see it, the same thing that Christ Himself did. He didn't stay on this mountain either. He went up there, He revealed Himself, and yet He's coming back down. He's bringing His boys with Him because He had a mission. Because Jesus' destiny was not to stay on this hill, but His mission was accomplished at another hill about six months after this, a hill called Golgotha. That was Jesus' real purpose. Because He didn't come at this particular time to rule and reign and to set up this royal majesty that He displayed on top of this hill. Actually, what He did, He came to die. And He came to be hung on a cross and die on another hill a few months from now. So we don't stay on the mountains. They had to come down the mountain, and we need to as well. We need to experience those moments of closeness, of intimacy, of being filled up with the glory of God. And then you know what we do with it? We get to work. We come back down the mountain, and we can't wait for the next one for sure. We endure the valleys, but we work for Him. We get busy doing what has to be done. He goes on from there, and he says... 
on the way down the mountain, Jesus commands them, tell no one the vision. Come on, Jesus. You want me to not tell that? How many remember a few years back? I don't remember the year now. It's 14, 15? No, it was before that. What was the what was the Auburn run back in the Iron Bowl? What year was that? Anybody? Josh, you got to remember that. You blocked it. <laughs> it's a mental block. <laughs> So that, you remember that event, though. You know what I'm talking about? Auburn caught the, there was one second left. They had it put back on the clock. Auburn ran it back. It was incredible. They won the Iron Bowl, and all the Alabama fans said, the one time Nick Saban did the wrong thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> now, how often did you talk about that after? Well, Alabama fans, not much at all, but the rest of the world told everybody. So they're coming down this mountain. They've just seen something they have never seen before. Really, no one had ever seen before. Even two Old Testament saints have shown up. God the Father has spoken. Jesus is shining. And then he says, but tell no one the vision until I'm raised from the dead. Now, interestingly, the grammar here is deeper than you may even think. He's not, he doesn't just say, don't mention this to anybody. He's, the, the grammar uh, here is actually in a, such a case where it's, don't mention anything about this ever. Don't, don't let any, don't even like, well, there's one time, Jesus, no, don't talk about anything. Let there be no potential of any discussion of this event between Peter, James, and John and the rest of the boys at all until I'm raised from the dead. From this point forward, it's like this didn't even happen. Now, how would that be trying to hold that in? If you just saw that, and now you're being told, there is no way you can mention one thing about this to a soul until I'm raised from the dead. Ooh, Jesus is saying, hush. Now that's hard. I don't know if I'd have pulled that off. Also here, he says, tell no one until... I don't want you all to misunderstand this one phrase here. He says, tell no one the vision. You see that word vision. You see it. Say vision if you see vision. Vision, you see, okay, three of y'all, me and y'all are talking. This word vision is not the word used uh, typically as a vision as revelation was. It's the word, that's the word apocalypsis or revealing. That's not what this word is. This word is not a vision that means uh, that Jesus put them in some sort of trance and, and let their mind see something that wasn't real. This word vision is actually something they physically experienced and saw in front of them. So don't read this and see vision and think that this was some event conjured up by Jesus and he's some nice little wizard man. No, he is God and he revealed himself in a real way, really literally in front of them and they experienced it physically and saw it. So tell no one about this vision, this real thing. And in essence, what he's telling them is don't spill the beans. Well, you ever spilled the beans? <laughs> ever literally spilled the beans? <laughs> Have you ever... Falling asleep with beans in a pot on the stove and woke up with, with burnt, burnt beans. We had a bunch of beans in a pressure cooker once. And then we had a bunch of beans all over the kitchen. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Don't skimp on your pressure cooker. Go ahead and spend some extra money. Get a good one. Because I was walking to the kitchen to check them. And they exploded before I turned the corner to go to the kitchen. Just blew ever. I mean everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> the people who came into that, who moved into that uh, apartment after we left, probably still found beans. But you know the origin of this phrase? Or just a quick little history lesson. This is bonus. This is free and it doesn't count in my time. Uh, spilling the beans actually comes from ancient Greece. Back in, in ancient Greece, the way that you would vote... You wouldn't mail it in. <laughs> but what you would do is they had a jug, and you had a white or a dark colored bean. And you would bring either your white bean for your upvote or your dark bean for your downvote, and you'd put it in this jar. you put it in this jug. And you couldn't see it. And everybody would come and anonymously put their beans in a jar. And no one would know the results prematurely. Unless someone like me comes along and spills the beans. <laughs> I would find a way. And then it's, it's that revelation of information prematurely. Jesus is saying, do not tell anybody about this until I'm raised from the dead. So, so we get this idea. They've just seen something incredible. Now they're coming down this mountain and he says, hush about it. 
And Jesus, that seems like the exact opposite thing that you always tell us. You tell us to spread this incredible message of Jesus to everybody. So the obvious question then is why? Why, Jesus, why would you say this? And why is a great question. It's a question that can be used for a good or bad purpose. We can use why to get to deep truths. You keep asking why. That's how we discover things. That's how we find out things. It's also how children can drive their parents crazy. Why? 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 And what does it end up with? Because I said so. I look forward to saying that a lot. Because I said so. But in essence, Jesus doesn't give them a why here. He is the king. He is the Lord. And it is because he said so. However, this is not a question that actually does go unanswered. The question of why, if you're wondering why Jesus would give this directive, it does go answered, but you have to look in other places where this sort of event occurs. Where Jesus did something incredible and yet told people, don't mention this to anybody. In the Gospel of Matthew, there's five accounts of different times when Jesus revealed something incredible and yet said, don't tell anybody. Just in chapter 16, we looked at before, when they reveal him to be the Christ and Peter confesses he's the Christ, he says, don't tell anybody I'm the Christ until I'm raised from the dead. He tells this sort of thing in different places. And why, though, would he continue and, and throughout the Gospels tell them not to reveal who he really is? Well, a couple of reasons. One, the powers of darkness are on a mission just like Jesus is, and their mission is to stop the mission of Jesus. Anytime Jesus is going forward, he's trying to, uh, you know, he's going out to accomplish God's will. The devil don't like that, right? The world doesn't like it. Darkness is against Jesus' mission. And let me tell you, it was the same then in the first century, and it's the same today. When you go out to accomplish God's mission, do His will, darkness is not for you in those moments. But greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? So we keep going. But also, I think a big reason is because people are very easily swayed. Did y'all know that? I know y'all are not, but people are. People are very easily swayed. And the thing is, Jesus did not come in the first century to be a celebrity. He didn't come to be famous. He didn't come to be a celebrity. He came to be a sacrifice. Yet, He was also doing incredible things. And when somebody does incredible things, it can draw, draw an incredible crowd. Let me just give you two quick examples of why I think Jesus is telling them not to reveal something this incredible. First, over in Mark chapter 1, Jesus has an interaction with a leper beginning in verse 40. And in verse 40, he, a leper comes and he begs Jesus to heal him. Jesus is, is kind enough to heal him. He reaches out his hand. He touches them. It's an incredible story. He's completely healed. And then verse 45 says, But he went out and began to talk freely about all this, and the news spread so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. He made him a celebrity. Now, ironically, this man was just healed, but verse 44 says, See that you say nothing to anyone about what I've done. <laughs> he just gets healed and he's disobedient. Ain't that about how we are? And yet, the result here is Jesus can no longer enter into a town. He doesn't want to be a celebrity. He couldn't actually get into towns anymore to minister in that way. People had to start coming out to him. The other one, the one I really enjoy, is over in John. John's Gospel has his record in chapter 6 of the feeding of the 5,000. Remember, the feeding of the 5,000 appears in every Gospel account along with the resurrection. And after he feeds these 5,000 people, who were probably more like 25,000, if we count women and children and everybody who would have been there, it was 5,000 men. He feeds them all out of the little boy's snack lunch. Y'all remember this story? An incredible moment. And yet, verse 15 says, perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again by a mountain to himself. He comes and He delivers to this group of people, a massive crowd of people on this hillside, a free meal. Their response is, well, He needs to be king. Of course, the irony is Jesus is king. <laughs> but that's not the kind of king they were looking for. They wanted the king that brings free stuff. They love to see the earth. The first century, they didn't have Walmart. I know, it hadn't been around that long. And they actually spent most of their day, most of their life was growing or procuring food to eat. That was the way they had to live. So along comes this guy who could produce free food for everybody and eat all they wanted. Well, he needs to be the king. 
Let me tell you this, and this is true then and this is true now. Someone who produces or promises a bunch of free stuff to you is no reason to follow that person. That's no reason to make anybody king in your life because they can produce some free stuff or they can promise you some free stuff. It always makes me think of uh, the kids who run for class president back in the day and it was always, we're going to, you vote for me and I'll put high C in all the water fountains. But people are easily swayed. They wanted a free meal. They wanted this man who could produce what they needed in an earthly sense. But yet, the beautiful thing is, Jesus does provide something free of charge. But it's free to you. And it's the most important thing you could ever receive. Forgiveness of your sins. Your greatest problem is that we sin. That's our greatest issue. And Jesus freely provides a way for that forgiveness of your sins to be experienced. It's free to you if you believe in Him, put faith in Him. However, it wasn't free, was it? It actually cost the life, the blood of our Lord Jesus. Hung on a cross so that we could be forgiven. That's the King we follow. Not someone who can promise some free fish and crackers, but one who would actually go out and die for the sins of the world. So Jesus didn't want to come for celebrity. If he wanted to be a celebrity, he wouldn't have been born in a manger, would he? He'd have been born glowing on golden sheets in the palace. Yet our God was born in a manger. He didn't come to rule at this time. He actually came to die. But to die, which may not sound like a very kingly thing to do, through his death, he actually destroyed death itself. Are you familiar with the end of 1 Corinthians 15? Let me read this to you. 1 Corinthians 15. If this doesn't give you a mountaintop experience, I'm, we're probably just going home now. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 54, he said, The perishable puts on imperishable. The mortal puts on immortality. That's when, when this earthly body is finally gone away with. He said, Then it shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You know, it's easy to fear death. Christian need have no fear of death at all. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Verse 57 says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me tell you what's awesome. we got a God who died for us. And through His death, He destroyed death, sin. And He removed the potential of God's people going to hell ever. That's the king we follow. But then you may get a little confused back in Matthew 17. Or he says, right after this, the, uh, the disciples ask a question. They don't seem to ask why they can't tell anybody, but in verse 10 they ask a question. Why do the scribes say that uh, Elijah must come first? Now the scribes there are the great teachers of the time. And, and it may be confusing here why the disciples would ask this, but the, the disciples know the Old Testament, as we should too, but the first century Jew knew the Old Testament really well. And they had just seen Elijah Elijah the prophet on top of this mountain. And they also know Malachi 4, 5, and 6 that closes the Old Testament that says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come smite the earth with a curse. They're expecting the coming of Elijah before the last days. And they have just seen Elijah on the mountain. So for them, the logical connection is, well, we've just seen this moment. This must be it. This is the start of the end times. This is Jesus' reign. This is when it's all going to kick off. But Jesus says, no, that's not the case. He said, Elijah will come. And I, the Bible does teach that Elijah will return before the return of the Lord. Not the rapture. That's what we look forward to as the church. But he will come before the return of Jesus in the end. He says, but however, the spirit of Elijah has already come. The disciples realize that it's John the Baptist. You remember him. He was the eccentric man calling people to repent and baptizing people when Jesus came on the scene and began his ministry, baptized Jesus himself. But Jesus says, look, John the Baptist came. He was, in essence, the spirit of Elijah that Isaiah talked about that was preparing the way for my arrival. And yet he wasn't revered and respected as this Elijah figure that had come, but yet he was abused, he was jailed, he was rejected, ultimately killed, beheaded by King Herod. 
That's how the world treated the Elijah who came. kind of sad when you think about it. How often does the world miss the glory of God? How often does life take place and people go about their normal day and they miss the many miracles that take place all along the way? If anything from health being cured, issues, peace being brought in a hard time, or, you know, driving down 23rd Street and not hitting anything or being hit by anything. Miracles occur every day, just like the spirit of John the Baptist, or the spirit of Elijah through John the Baptist came in that day and it was rejected. As Christians, we need to be hyper aware of the works of God because we don't want to miss anything. So what does all this then, this whole package, and let me just land with this, what, what does this sort of the backside of the mountain experience that these disciples had with Jesus, what does that teach us? What does that give us here 2,000 years later? Matthew, why did you put all this in here when you could have just skipped to another miracle? <laughs> let me give you three quick things, and that's it. I'm Baptist, so it had to be three. First, enjoy the mountaintop experiences. They don't happen often, but they can happen more than you think if you'll plug into Jesus. Enjoy the mountaintop experiences. Seek those out. Enjoy them for what they are. Thank God for when you have them. Get filled up from them. Get excited about the Lord when you experience Him in that kind of way. And then get to work for Him. If all you live for is to feel good about your Christian faith and you're not doing anything from that, you're only half there. We have a mountaintop experience so that we can come down and then we can get to work. Number two, follow Jesus' commands. Now, if we look to our text right here, we'd say, wait a minute. But his command was to tell no one about this vision. Yet we know that John 14, 15 says, Jesus himself says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, Jesus, are we supposed to keep this commandment? Tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead? No. Why? Because he's been raised from the dead. You know, the resurrection was a really big deal. It proved it was all true. And so what do we do? We start spilling the beans all the time. <laughs> this is a message we can't keep to ourselves. Because remember, the, the command changed from here. Don't tell anybody this until I was raised from the dead. Then after he's raised from the dead, he said, go and make disciples. Go spread this word. Go tell it to anybody. And with John 14, 15, again, hear it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. His commandment is to go and spread the word. Therefore, if we're not going and spreading the word, therefore we're not keeping his commandments, then can we say we really love him? Or is he just a king we want to get stuff from? We've got to get to work. Time to spill the beans and spread them all over the world. Number three, and this is the last thing, don't miss God moments. They missed John the Baptist coming in the spirit of Elijah, and it was awful. Many commentators think that Jesus may have instigated the kingdom on earth at that point if he would have been received, yet he was rejected. Don't miss God moments. They can happen all the time if we're paying attention, if we're looking for them. If you're praying more, I guarantee you, you'll see more prayers get answered. And the result will be more reason to praise. We've got to pay attention. But I'll say this and challenge you with this. Don't miss this God moment. Because I think when the church gathers together, God shows up. You know, He said, two or more gathered, I am in the midst, so we can take Him at His word. But I guarantee you that there's people in the house today that have been challenged by something from the Scriptures. It's a God moment. When you sang a song, did you enjoy it? Was it something to praise God? Is it something to hear from God today? In Sunday school, was something great? Did you have a moment with God today? You're being challenged today. You're being encouraged today. What is it? Don't let this God moment pass. Because when we pay attention, they come all the time. So whatever God has impressed upon you this morning, follow through with it. If it's to believe in Him for the first time, do it. 
You're a sinner, I'm a sinner, but He died for us. We can believe in Him and have everlasting life. If you've never believed that message, believe it today. What is it? Is it to follow Him more closely? Is He leading you to just be a little closer, pray a little more, spend a little more time with Him? Commit to doing it today. I know for me, a lot of times it's just submitting to Him more frequently. Matthew shows that Jesus is king, and yet when I look at who's really in control of my life, far too little. <laughs> is it the true king? What's the case in your own heart? Don't let this God moment pass. What business do you have to deal with Him today? Do it. If you need to talk about it, I'll be down here during this time of invitation in a moment. You can talk to many Christians and brothers and sisters in this house. If you want to hang out after, we can talk after. But whatever God has for you to do today, let's grab a hold of this God moment and not let it go. Let's pray.